Good morning, everyone. We're back, and we have, oh, where's Karen? She's around here? No, I'm just kidding. Now, she's not here today. Um, she is, uh, will be here next week. So I'm here to answer all of your questions on social media, as well as the phones. The number should be on the screen down below. And hopefully this will work just fine. I do want to get right into it. Uh, if there's anything that I say that, you know, that gives you a tip or anything like that, just realize I'm not trying to diagnose you or replace your medical care. Check with your doctor before taking any of this information. It's just purely for your own research. On that note, uh, Esther's been waiting patiently. I think she's called before. Are you there from Oklahoma? Yes, sir. Hi. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Two short questions. I don't want to take your time. Do 42 hour fasting. Okay. Uh, I eat every other day. I do all mad, salad, and then two hours later eat my veggies. Take your electrolytes, minerals, and other supplements. Dr. Berg, I feel nauseous. That's one question. The okay. other one is ha have high C-reactive protein, inflammation, osteoarthritis. You food carnivore diet with pulse. How much protein is good? Those are my questions. I, I missed the last question. Can you clarify the last question? I have high C-reactive protein. Okay, high C-reactive protein. Osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. And we said about uh, carnivore diet. The protein in oh. carnivore will help inflammation. Okay. So how much protein is good? Those are my questions. Okay. So good question. The first question, during a 48-hour fast, you're getting nauseousness. Now, that usually relates to the gallbladder. What happens when you're not eating is uh, you have the gallbladder concentrating the bile, sometimes very concentrated up to um, 20 times. Um, but just realize that you don't have to be concerned about gallstones because if you have more bile, more concentrated bile, uh, you'll have less stones because that's, the tr that's usually the treatment for bile stones is to take more bile salts. Um, or that's the treatment for gallstones, by the way. So I wouldn't worry about that. I think what you should do, there's a video, it's called Liver and Gallbladder Flushing, I, if I'm not mistaken. And I ha it's a video that actually shows you how to manually kind of massage the, the different uh, organs. Um, you know, you exercise your muscles, um, but people don't actually think they can actually do anything for the gallbladder or other, you know, like the intestines and just massage the area. So underneath the right rib cage, if you massage that area, I have this in the video, what you can do is you can help to facilitate more um, flow and drainage, and that usually should help you with that, uh, that nauseousness. Um, you can also take um, various supplements to help increase the flow of bile, like radishes, for example, and that will also decrease that symptom as well. Now, you're, you have high C-reactive protein. That's an inflammatory marker. If you're doing fasting and the inflammation is still there, um, that's very weird. You, it should go away. You may want to take a lot more vitamin D uh, at probably about 20,000 IUs at least. Make sure you take the K2 with it. Um, it wouldn't hurt to try the carnivore diet because um, that really addresses a lot of inflammatory conditions in the, in the, in the, in the gut and the small and large intestine. Um, that's really good for SIBO and irritable bowel syndrome and even autoimmune um, because sometimes people are sensitive to fiber, vegetables, and then that can stir up a hornet's nest. Um, so you can try it out and see if you feel better um, for a few months and then go back to vegetables at a, a nice slower pace. Personally, I, I do very well on the combination of meat and vegetable. Um, Sometimes people are concerned about counting vegetables because they, um, you know, they're high in um, carb. But I'm going to release a video this week to show you uh, the majority of these vegetables have less than one gram of carb per cup, and a lot of them only have like two or three grams of carbs. You're allowed 20 to 50 grams, so you really don't have to worry about that. But um, they're out of all the vegetables, um, there's a couple, and I'm not talking about potato or anything like that. 
I'm not, I'm not going to even cover corn <laughs> because we're not even going to consider that. Out of all the vegetables, um, believe it or not, artichokes and peas have the, have the majority of, uh, or they have the highest concentration of carbs. So, um, but still, even if you have those, you still might be within the normal range. So I wouldn't uh, necessarily have to cut that out as, as well. So um, let's go right to Helen. She's been waiting patiently from Reno. Are you there, Helen, from Nevada? Yes, I am. Great. What's your, what's your question? I've been recently diagnosed with primary biliary, they used to call it cirrhosis, now they call it cholangitis. Yeah. Basically, inflammation, bile leaking into my liver. So I want to know nutritionally how to handle that. Yeah. To help support my liver the best. Are you on keto or intermittent fasting? I'm on both. I do um, 20 hours fasting and four hours eating, sometimes six. And um, keto, yes, 100%. Okay, great. No. So you want to facilitate uh, more support for the gallbladder, of course, and the liver. Um, there's, there's a couple things that you need to know about nutrition-wise for uh, about cirrhosis, which is fibrosis, which is, comes from inflammatory mar uh, high inflammation. Um, out of all the nutrients, vitamin E and selenium as a mineral in, uh, together uh, is very good for the uh, inflammatory markers as well as preventing cirrhosis of the, of the liver. So if you get on a real complete vitamin E complex with both all the tocopherols and the tocotrienols and took some selenium, you don't have to take much and take that every day, that will actually help you. Um, I would also consume radishes and um, a good amount of vegetable cruciferous just to keep that gallbladder going. And I think that's, that would be the best thing. Um, also realize that the more fasting you do, the more you're gonna get an autophagy, especially if you're doing um, periodic prolonged fasting. The autophagy will clean up some of that scar tissue that's developing, but vitamin E for the liver is um, amazing. I'm gonna release a video on vitamin E that I'm gonna actually do today, which has to do with the most important function of vitamin E, so stay tuned for that. Um, Good, good questions, and I have a ton of questions coming in. Uh, let me see if I could take one here. My husband has chronic, this is from Felicia Bates. My husband has chronic kidney disease, stage three, and he's a diabetic. His dietician said keto and IF is not good. Um, blah, 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 okay. What should he do? Well, I would um, check with the the medical doctor for this question, if, if stage three, you, he may or may not be okay, uh, uh, approved for doing foods high in potassium. Sometimes um, the doc will say, you know what, go ahead and do it because it really is the stage four or five where you, ha you, you have to be careful of phosphorus and certain nutrients like potassium. So you wanna check what nutrients he has to make sure that he doesn't have too many. But Generally speaking, potassium is protective to the kidney um, in a healthy kidney, but you want to check with the doc. As far as a diet goes, as long as you avoid those nutrients that are a problem, um, keto, especially intermittent fasting too, together would be very beneficial, lowering the carb for the kidney, because what do you want to do? Do a high carb diet for the kidney? High carbohydrates are what got the kidney into trouble in the first place. So like, take a look at one of the major organs that's affected from a diabetic um, is the kidney, kidney destruction. So why would anyone would want, you to, want you to be on a high carb diet? It doesn't make sense. Low carb is what you want to do, but then just check with the nutrients because that could be an issue. All right, uh, Doc, since we're on with low carb, uh, E. Alba yeah. writes, is low carb okay, with, uh, okay when he's in hypothyroidism? Yeah. Uh, hypothyroidism is a low thyroid. M most hypothyroid cases are, have Hashimoto's. That's an autoimmune condition. And with that condition, um, you get on keto and IF, your hormones, especially with the T3, 
will go down a little bit. And you might be concerned about that and like, wait a second, I thought, that, I thought it was supposed to be helpful. But if you actually uh, have your thyroid stimulating hormone measured, which is how they diagnose hypothyroidism, that will be fine. Be, but because you're actually altering your diet in a way that doesn't require as much, um, like you're, you're actually oxidizing fat more, you're using more efficient uh, pathways, uh, the need for thyroid hormones are gonna be a little less. So as long as you're getting the nutrients from the diet when you eat, I think doing a healthy keto plan and intermittent fasting is, is pure dynamite to help you. And um, it's not going to be a problem at all. In fact, actually, especially if 90% um, of all hypothyroid cases are autoimmune, why wouldn't you want to do intermittent fasting? Because intermittent fasting um, reduces inflammation and that should help any autoimmune case. Does that sound good? It certainly does. Okay. And listen, I am the advocate for Facebook today with Karen gone, so I haven't forgotten about you. I'm not nearly as efficient as her, but I'm gonna do my best. So okay. uh, to that end, Ryan on Facebook, if I only do IF, can I still take your electrolyte powder? I would think so. If you only do iron? No, if you only do um, intermittent fasting, oh. can you still take your electrolyte powder? Yeah, yeah, there's no cal uh, barely any calories, just minerals. You can take that on an empty stomach when you're fasting, not a problem. Uh, I will say there has been some questions. When, is, when are we gonna have the trace minerals in? We have it in right now, okay? So if you go to the site, you can check it out. This is trace minerals. It's in a capsule right now, and it's enhanced. So if you, this is what you've been waiting for. It's in, I'm taking, it's awesome. It's the same formula as before. However, I actually spiked it with more um, zinc, molybdenum, manganese, copper, chromium, and a few other trace minerals that I really like, that I personally would like on a regular basis. I didn't put them in very, very large amounts, just enough to be, have a normal amount. So one a day, we'll keep the doctor away. So that is available. Trace minerals are good to act as uh, helper molecules for proteins, not just the hair, nails, and muscle, and skin, but all the protein um, machinery that runs the cell. So that's gonna be very important. And by the way, I talked about vitamin E before. Vitamin E is essential f as an antioxidant to prevent the breakdown of um, the, the cell membrane. That's really, really important in a lot of things, which I think I wanna release that video for you guys so you can check it out. All right, someone had a question about, see if I can find it. <laughs> Zeolite, um, yeah, zeolite is a, uh, it's a type of mineral compound that is from volcanic ash, and um, it's a really good, it's called an ion exchanger. So it ha allows um, uh, ions to um, collect or connect to it like a magnet, and it can help pull out uh, toxins and heavy metals, country and western, just want to see if uh, Steve was awake there. <laughs> um, different, different toxic elements. See, when you do a, uh, a detox, whether you're doing it from some herbal thing or trying to kill off something in your body, if you don't take something like that or uh, bentonite clay or charcoal, activated charcoal, you end up getting sick because the die-off from the, s the byproducts from the, the bacteria or yeast or fungus just like wipe you out, creates an immune reaction. So, Something like this, it's called zeolite, uh, or other things like bentonite clay, will help to absorb and detoxify these poisons without you feeling bad. All right, let's go to, um, I think it's uh, Lucy from Texas, or Lukai, one of the two. Lucy. Lucy. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Dr. Berg. I am 44. I have Meniere's disease. I was diagnosed with that a few years ago, and then at the same time found out that I have nodules in my, in my thyroid. Now, never have, have had a abnormal TSH uh, lab, uh, at least not yet. And then not too long ago, I was also diagnosed with fibroids in my uterus. So okay. I just ordered your liver package yesterday and okay. electrolyte and I just wanted to know if there's anything else 
that you recommend. Um, I'm also having red eyes. I've been on keto for a month. You're having red eyes? Yes, like okay. the little veins in my, okay. and the white part of my eyes are just very red lately. Okay, okay. Very good question. Fair enough. Um, so what I would recommend, uh, you're on the right thing to support the liver, especially for the eyes and the blood vessels. Uh, it could be a little bit of a blood sugar issue that you're transitioning. Now that you're on keto, you may want to just, um, just adjust your fasting just to make sure that you're not going too far that your blood sugars drop. Because I know blood sugar issues can create the irritation with the eye. I don't know if that's it. Maybe not, but something to consider. But here's the thing. Um, iodine from sea, sea kelp would be really, really beneficial, the Icelandic sea kelp, because um, what that does is it helps to regulate excessive amounts of estrogen, which then uh, prevent things like fibrocystic breast, um, things that like cysts in the ovaries, fibroids that can develop, because those are like estrogen specific, uh, as well as um, cysts in the thyroid. So now I'm not saying that that's going to cure you at all. I'm just saying that you should look in the area of iodine and regulation of estrogen. That's, that's very important. Um, you probably want to um, also take vitamin B1, um, and that is actually a nutritional yeast. That would be also very beneficial for you. But um, I think you may have a little bit of estrogen dominance. So do some research on that. But I think you're going to be on the right track when you get that kit. And just apply what I uh, have in my book to a T. Okay? All right. So now, let's see here. Doc, I can throw one in from Facebook. Yeah. Laura Baum uh, wants to know, does an Altoid count uh, put you out of a fast? Is there enough sugar in it to put you out of keto, ketosis? Well, the fact that it has sugar in it, um, you should probably not take it. There's so many other things you can take that don't have sugar. Uh, I think it will affect you to some degree. I don't know how long, maybe a very short period of time. But I don't know. I would probably find something else that didn't have sugar. Okay. Now, there's a question. Uh, I'm going to run through these because there's so many questions. Okay. Someone asked, um, ask, uh, how do you know if you have low stomach acid? Well, the biggest indication for that is indigestion. So if you're eating something and you feel like it's not digesting or you have a hard time digesting protein, um, let's say, for example, you sit down and you have a Texas-style steak, 20 ounces, and you can't digest that. I'm being very sarcastic. But if you can't digest protein or you don't like, you just can't deal well with red meat, then you probably need more hydrochloric acid. All right, next question is, um, I'm going to support my hair. Um, but I have gallstones, what should I do about that? Well, the minerals that are really needed, especially the trace minerals, for supporting the hair, especially if you're doing ketosis, um, need a good, strong stomach acid. Okay, that's number one. But also, you do need, the fact that you have gallstones just tells me that you need more bile salts. And the bile also is involved in the absorption of certain minerals as well, especially the fat-soluble, actually vitamins. This is the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K. So those are also very essential for hair, uh, especially if you're getting hair loss, because let's say, for example, you're having uh, oxidative stress in the, in the uh, scalp, and you get excessive hydrogen peroxide, whatever, uh, a lot of free radicals, another thing called ROS, and, uh, and you need vitamin E for that vitamin E is really important for the hair. Well, you don't have the bile to absorb it, so that could be why you have the problem in the first place. All right, another question is, how do I manage medication supplements on intermittent fasting? Well, you know what? Just take them. Um, if you need to take your medication, just take them when you need to take them. Uh, if you need to take them with food, then you're going to have to wait to your meal. Uh, as far as supplements go, I, w I, I, I always recommend not worrying about taking supplements. They're not going to kick you out of ketosis. Uh, they'll enhance ketosis unless they have sugar or protein, as in bone broth or collagen, or um, branch-chain amino acid. You want to avoid those. 
All right, then another question, uh, question about IBS. Um, IBS, uh, that can create a lot of malabsorption problems, so the best thing I, I would recommend is something like chlorophyll or wheatgrass juice powder. Take that in an empty stomach. Do fasting. Make sure you're not consuming any type of grains at all. And you may actually benefit from carnivore for at least a month or two if, you, if it's really severe, especially if you have like tons of allergies and no matter what you eat, you're always bloated and you may have what's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. All right, so uh, the last question is I can't actually make out my handwriting, so I'm gonna have to go to uh, Robin. She's, been, she's in New Mexico. Are you there, Robin? You had a question. Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, um, well, first of all, I've been on keto for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost from 200 pounds down to 150. Wow. Um, I do intermittent fasting. I know I'm awesome. I'm so excited. Um, and um, I've, I've hit a stall. I'm at 150, and I've been here for over a month. I even started going to the gym, trying to... My goal weight is 130, but I'm just having such a hard time taking off those last 20 pounds. Okay. Hey, I had a question. Um, are you doing um, the type of keto you're doing? Are you doing like, like just 100 percent, or are you doing sort of keto sometimes? No, I'm pretty much doing keto all the time. Okay, good. Um, how long are you fasting for? Um. Well, let's see. I usually don't eat till about two. Okay. About yeah, about one or two, and I usually have my my last meal at about seven. Got it. And do you have a history of doing a lot of diets? Oh, yeah. Okay. And what's your age again? <laughs> I'm 48. Okay. And do you have... Um, the other question relates to, do you have a history of eating a lot of refined sugars or grains? Okay. I was a I was a major sugar junkie. Okay. All right. So this is a perfect good question to bring this up. We're dealing with a, this is a common thing, Robin. When you have someone that's uh, either premenopausal, menopausal, now you have the history of the dieting, which by the way slows your metabolism, and then you have a history of eating a lot of carbs, which creates insulin resistance, and now we're left with a very slow metabolism. So I'm glad that you're doing it exactly by the book because if you were doing sort of keto that wouldn't work uh, I think with you this is going to be uh, the, the next action to do would be to one meal a day one meal a day because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get your body to convert to burn your own fat which is one of the healthiest things that you can do tap in your own fat to do that we have to bring the carbs down well um, keto is low carb but intermittent fasting is no carb so you can really bring your your uh, insulin down and start speeding up your metabolism to force your body to actually live off your own fat. So I would just do one meal a day. I think that should handle it. And then you can always add some other things too to speed it up. Uh, you can actually get more sleep, try to cut down stress, add exercise. You know, Steve, in practice, I had a lady who um, came in, and I'm not kidding, she was exercising six hours a day and she lost no weight loss so I have the advantage of have been in practice for 29 years and had a chance to work with a lot of different types of cases that you would not normally see if you were just uh, you know not in working with people because sometimes you have people that are like even keto experts but they've never actually had a, a wide range of clients to you know, like I, I didn't accept uh, insurance, so I had a cash practice. So if you didn't get results, people wouldn't come back. So it, it kept increasing the bar to the point where I had to perform a miracle like really quick or people wouldn't come back. So I would have to try different things, be very creative and come up with different things. And um, I would get, just when you got it figured out, you'd hit someone else come in. They're doing keto perfectly and they're still not losing weight. One lady is doing one meal a day, no weight loss. Another lady, six hours exercise a day and still no weight loss. So what do you do in those situations, right? So what I found is uh, you, 
you have to sometimes do intermittent fasting longer and longer and longer. So one meal every other day for some of these people. And well, then start flipping things around. Well, I'm going to say I've got a client for you because Osa uh, is, her problem is losing too much weight. She's asking, can I only do IF without keto? I'm already too slim, and it seems that keto makes people slim. So there's a happy customer. Yeah, it is a problem. This whole thin thing is like, it's really a problem for some people. Um, I, I battle it every day. I, I know you do. I, I would um, recommend do keto, but just do three meals, no snacks. Do keto, three meals, no snack, snacks. Um, if you want to actually put some serious fat on a person really quick, uh, what you do, Steve, is you have them do three meals and you have them do empty, carbo em empty nutrition, like empty carbohydrates, and a lot of them. And then you add additional snacks between breakfast and lunch and afternoon snacks. So you're always eating every three hours and definitely right before bed. And then you do the f big apples, do the chips, do nuts. Just keep grazing. Maybe a beer, some wine at night, and then take a nap after each meal. Stick with it, folks. You'll get there. With yeah, and you'll, you'll actually keep your weight on. All right, good. So Veronica from Iowa had a question about shingles. Are you there? Yes, I am. And nobody likes shingles. I know. Uh, I, I, I do not vaccinate and uh, won't. Good. Um, but, but, and I don't have any children to go breathe the air that have chicken pox, you know, so that right. I can, my body can recognize the virus. What do we do about this? How do people in my situation handle, what can we do to not get them? Is there a way to not get them? Well, once, once you have it, um, you have it. Um, there's a couple things you can do. Um, I try to also search up my video on this because I have some more data, but I'm going to give you the quick answer. Um, these viruses are, are very fascinating, uh, little buggers. They, they're not alive, but they're not dead. So what, is it, what do I mean by that? They basically leech off energy from your own cells. So they can invade your cells when you're stressed, when you're nutritionally deficient, and you get older. So they come out of remission and they create an immune reaction. So your own immune system is really creating the problem because it senses this darn virus is coming out of remission. Um, so, but that being said, there is some interesting data about actually getting rid of viruses and that has to do with autophagy, uh, doing periodic prolonged fasting. Like let's say every week you do it a fasting uh, for two or three days. Um, and you're really forcing your body to clean out this old, these old pathogens, yeast, fungus, mold, viruses, to clean that out. That's one way. Uh, that's going to strengthen your immune system. Uh, zinc, uh, vitamin D, and vitamin C are the best things to take to, to kind of keep your immune system strong, keep the cellular um, membrane strong to keep the, the shingle, this virus, in at bay. That's what you can do. And uh, watch my video on that. I have a, a couple other additional things you can do. So it's really about getting your immune system strong and definitely keep, keeping off the sugars, which I, I think you're already doing. But stress is a factor. You're going to have to find every, find the source of that stress and really just do what you can to avoid it. So Steve, I, um, you know, there's a really, 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 really valuable tool that I want to I want to tell you and others that you can use when solving your health problems. Would you like to know it? Absolutely. Okay, good. Would everyone like to know that? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, no, no one's actually saying yes. So. Just me. Okay, just you. Uh, so I'll just tell you. Um, this is so simple, yet it's so powerful. Yet, in the medical profession, they're not really emphasizing this as the superior thing when you evaluate someone. I know you're probably going to get to the point. Um, anytime you have a plateau or a sudden weight gain or um, you're trying to solve a health problem, let's say you have a bloating, whatever, you know, you want to find out what occurred just before this symptom started 
like weight gain, for example. When did you start gaining weight and have a stubborn metabolism? Right when I got pregnant. Okay, thank you. That gives me data. Uh, I mean, how many times have I, in practice, had someone say, well, oh, I, I have this serious digestive problem. If I started treating them and, or, or giving them recommendations without first finding out when did it start, what happened just before it, it's disastrous. And you'd be shocked to find out what you hear when you say that. Okay, when did it start? Last Tuesday. What did you eat? Boom. Doritos. How much? A bag this big. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we're getting somewhere. I mean, I've had people who had heart symptoms, chest pain so bad, uh, caused them to go to the doctor's office and, and the hospital and pay, pay $40,000, and they didn't find anything. But they failed to ask, when did it start? What did you eat just before that? What occurred? And you find out, oh, I've been in a split, or I've never eat this, and I eat this, and then you, you start realizing this is coming from the digestive system, not the heart. It's being referred. I mean, this happens so often. Very, very simple. Um, but just if you have a health problem, isolate when it started and what occurred just before it. This is called uh, like a coinciding a, a certain thing with a certain thing. It, and I think what happens a lot of times is even though it's obvious, it's logical, sometimes the doctors will say, oh, no, that probably doesn't have anything to do with it. I mean, it's the only thing, it's the only big change that occurred. So anyway, that's just an extra tip. No charge, Steve. Absolutely. Luckily, uh, you know, most of it is not much of a mystery. I'm in denial many times. But most of my stuff are, are uh, you know, preceded by some nonsensical behavior on my part, and I can put my finger on it. Though I, don't, I do know that there are people that just, it's a mystery, and they don't know what's happened. But for most of us, I think, at least as it relates to eating, it's pretty obvious. Yes, it is pretty obvious. All right, so I'm going to go to Tom. Tom's in Boston. He had a question about keto. Are you there, Tom? Yes, I am. Thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. So I've uh, been doing keto for a year and a half and mm -hmm. lost 15 pounds and feel great. And um, just went to my uh, doctor for my annual checkup. And uh, so my uh, total cholesterol was through the roof, 438. Okay. But my remnant cholesterol, I watched your video on that, is mine. <laughs> so it's interesting wow. the previous one uh, my cholesterol when I was doing carb was uh, 311 but the remnant cholesterol was 35 so what do you make of all that well what, what's happening is uh, the remnant cholesterol is the stuff lingering around hanging out for no reason you're well within the normal range um, so cholesterol is something your body makes most of the cholesterol in your body is made by the body uh, also, as you lose weight, the cholesterol has to come out of the fat cells, some of it, and come out through the body. Um, but cholesterol is an exchange thing. So you have um, HDL, which is the cholesterol coming from the cell um, back up to the liver. Um, and then you have the LDL coming from the liver to the cell. So we have this exchange. So what's happening, mm -hmm. you're having just large amounts of cholesterol, but it's being exchanged in your body for some reason. It could be could be stress, could be your body's trying to build something up, it could be your body's starting to, um, needs more for repair in some aspects. It could be you're just using a lot of that fat for energy and that's kind of just circling out through the body. I would get a specialized test that measures the small, dense type of LDL versus the large, buoyant um, LDL, and that would be like pattern A, pattern B, and that would really give you the exact data you would need, and then you could learn more about that from the video that I did. But um, yeah, so that's interesting. Your remnant, I mean, it tells me that you're you're just getting more more exchange with cholesterol. Um, and so okay. yeah, I think you're really good to go on that one. Okay, one other question along with that. I also had my vitamin D level checked, and it was at 121. Uh, the, the range on my report says 30 to 60, so doctors said stop taking it. And yours was how much? When? Uh, 121. Okay. You know, um, there's, some, there's a lot of conflicting data. I have to do a video on this because um, the ranges of normal vitamin D are literally ridiculously way too low. Um, okay. And 
I don't know how they're basing it off of, but um, honestly, uh, I would. Um, well, maybe maybe I should add this. You know, I, I had my blood test done in the afternoon that morning. You know, I didn't have lunch. I just had a bulletproof coffee and my vitamin D. <laughs> would that? Yes. Would that raise it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, if you take okay. vitamin D before you get in for a test, that could explain the whole thing. Um, yeah, okay. you want to kind of not take it like 24 hours because also it's a fat soluble vitamin, but still, it'll be in your blood for a little bit, and that's probably what happened. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, thank you for all that you do. I've been really enjoying doing keto and intermittent fasting. It's been hey, great. You're welcome. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. All right. Okay, good. So someone had a question from Facebook. Are you answering questions on Facebook? Uh, yes, I am, as I can get to it. Let me take a question here. All right, this is from Blue Skies, Joe. K2 causes blood to clot. Um, okay, so vitamin K is a family of vitamins, and K1 is really the, the clotting factor. Um, however, if you have um, history of excessive clotting or you have a stroke or heart problem and you're on Coumadin, um, the doctors are not going to probably want you to take any K2 at all, which is fine. Um, you have a couple choices. You can um, take another form of, uh, of um, well, check with your doctor, but there's other forms of medication that that don't restrict the vitamin K1. They work in different ways, so that might be an option. The other thing, too, is that when you eat on the ketogenic diet, and I created a video on this, you want to consume um, high levels of vegetables but n without the vitamin K. You just need to know what they are. Uh, the squash, in fact, I would just go to my YouTube video and just kind of take notes on that and go on that program. But there's conflicting information, vitamin K2, does not primarily work on the clotting factor like K1. Um, so it's mainly a transportation of calcium. Um, so it deals with certain activation of certain proteins and to mobilize calcium out of the soft tissue. All right. LASIK surgery bad for eyes or not? Um, I don't have enough data to tell you yes or no. I know they do use it not on just anyone. You have to have a certain situation to have that. Um, I would personally, you know, I bring these things around right here, but I'm not using them anymore. Uh, it, ever since that I increased my fasting time, like my vision has gotten significantly better. So I fast, and I did a video on this. I fast for about, I think it's 20, 21 hours now. And man, my eyes just get better and better and better. But I will say, Steve, that um, when you sit in front of a screen, which I know a lot of people don't do that anymore, they're out there in nature. Now, when they're in front of a screen, boy, that just that really is really what's behind the eye, the visual problem. So you want to get out of your your office and get start getting out in nature at least one hour a day, and just get your vision going way the heck out there. I do it every day, or else I'd be right just right here, and I. Well, then I'm out of here. Hey, wait, come back here. <laughs> okay. By the way, to take care of the folks on Facebook, we are monitoring. And to prove it, uh, Jane Urban on Facebook says she really real, uh, just realized she has uh, tendinitis, or, or tonight, excuse me, the, the hearing issue, I believe, and found a video you made about it where you showed a technique to help the symptom. Uh, it uh, it uh, worked, and thank you. Now I have a way to get relief while I work on my... Uh, I think she means intermittent fasting, keto and IF. Anyway, I hope that made sense. So do you have any Good. recommendations for uh, tinnitus, I yeah. guess it's called? Yeah, so I have two techniques. You know, it, it doesn't work 100% of the time, Steve, but it works like significantly, I mean significant, I would, I would say maybe 60 to 70% of the time. So I would try it. There's two different techniques. Just search uh, on YouTube, Dr. Berg and tinnitus, um, ringing the ears. Now, I completely, now I'm coming back full circle. Uh, another lady asked a question about Meniere's. Um, that I would recommend, and I told her the rem remedy, which is B1, but I didn't tell her the connection. You'd want a fat soluble one called benfotamine. Benfotamine uh, penetrates the fat layer of the nerve 
and in the inner ear, and also if you have any peripheral neuropathy symptoms in your feet, and um, it really, really helps people. Um, it counters the complications of diabetes, but for some people, if it's really bad, you got to take it for quite a few months to really see the change. But it, there's some credible research on it. Okay, my doctor says I'm type 1 diabetic. How long should I do intermittent fasting? As long as you can. Um, I would play it by ear. If you have a lot of fat to lose, you know, let your body tell you how long to go. If you're not hungry, ride the wave. But make sure you take supplements to get your your nutrients, and then when you do eat, make sure it's a really nutrient-dense thing. Type 1 diabetics need to do keto as well because even though they have to take uh, insulin, they'll take a lot less if they reduce the amount of carbohydrates. Taking less insulin creates less problems, complications. If anyone tells you that insulin is perfectly safe to take regardless on the amounts, they're lying to you because uh, just take a look at the studies excessive amounts of insulin are very damaging to your system. All right, Steve? Absolutely. Okay, so someone said, how to fast when you're taking meds every 12 hours with food? Well, just take your meds when you need to. I mean, there's nothing mysterious about that. Okay, I'm finally getting, getting to the point where uh, where um, people are saying yes, 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 they want to know that question. So I guess I'm pretty low down on the list of things here. Um, I need to talk to Mon from Canada. Are you there? Yes. yes. Hi. Um, hi, Dr. Borg. Great to talk to you. Um, so I've been partially implementing your information for over a year, and unfortunately I didn't quite study properly. And I thought I was doing keto and intermittent fasting, but a kind of incorrect version. And um, I got more and more tired, and I was never losing belly fat or midsection fat. And my fatigue got so bad that the coffee wasn't even really helping me anymore. So then about six to seven weeks ago, I really studied all your info thoroughly, um, joined your membership site, which I should have done a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and... So from what I learned, I went on a four to five hour eating window and I ordered lots of your supplements, which I've been taking for two weeks. And I have lost um, weight about, in five to six weeks, I've lost about 14 to 22 pounds, um, which is great yeah. because I was never able to. But, I, but I've mostly lost, like I've lost a lot of weight on my arms and legs but still have um, fat on my belly. And I don't really want to lose any more weight on my arm, mm -hmm. arms and legs. So I think I'm going to start looking unhealthy. Um, it, it's kind of a little disproportionate. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a bit of the background. And then my question is about the second meal. Um, I've, I've had incredible fatigue in this keto adaptation. And I don't actually know if I'm in ketosis because the strips don't show at all that I am. Um, and so with the second meal, I, I don't really know if I'm hungry. I think it's more that I'm tired and the exhaustion is getting better with your supplements. But it, it's also like I can't imagine not having that second meal. Okay. Um, and, uh, but I don't know if I'm just tired uh, because I don't digest the second meal as well as the first one like I have some belching and light bloating after the second one but not after the first one okay and and I, I crave especially like the salad for the second one or, or like juicy okay um, why don't somewhere. you do why don't you do this okay why don't you <coughs> just have a salad a second meal um, go with your body like as far as what you need um, one of the things that produces energy in the body um, is having enough um, it's called ATP you get little energy factories that make the make the energy but um, I don't know if you've ever taken biology um, before Steve very little okay you ever hear of this thing called the Krebs cycle never heard of it okay never mind 
but there's a little energy pathway thing that uh, generates energy and there's it requires a lot of nutrients okay it requires b1 for the energy a magnesium and potassium and sodium so the biggest thing that i would recommend for, for you um, is i would recommend beefing up no pun intended your potassium maybe even sodium as well but probably more potassium we need massive amounts because potassium if you take a look up took a look at the condition of low po or potassium deficiency even if it's subclinical it's called hypokalemia look it up the the biggest symptom the first symptom is you're tired why because potassium is involved in the sodium potassium pump you have billions of these little pumps in your cells that are embedded into the cell outside of the cell it's called the cell membrane and it forms a battery so 30 percent of all your energy um, is allocated to these little pumps so without those pumps you get tired so more potassium generate more electricity more uh, nerve and muscle activation less potassium your muscles get weak you get tired you don't quite feel right so uh, it sounds like you're doing better you just need a little bit more and give it a little more time there I would also recommend that you try an experiment and try some to take some exogenous ketones when in the middle of the day just see if it doesn't give your brain some more energy because it could be that you have this uh, history of um, insulin resistance and you're not quite adapting fast enough so you can add that just to kind of give you more energy in this transition. Good question, though. Okay, uh, why don't we go over to Facebook yeah. and uh, answer Marion's question. Uh, can you address uric acid in the body? ACV is not working, and my level is 11. I do not have symptoms of gout, only burning in the body. I really want to avoid all the aluprinol, I believe. Yeah, uric acid... Um, acts like an antioxidant in the body and even when you have high levels or you have history of gout or uric acid kidney stones um, when you do fasting it can elevate as an antioxidant uh, function so the best way to reduce uric acid is just to make sure you're taking a moderate amount of protein because that's where it's coming from um, they say to do cherry juice and all this other stuff I don't recommend that I would recommend to um, alkalize your urine a little bit and the way to do that you can do more uh, green leafy greens vegetables chlorophyll and potassium citrate the citrates will help but the potassium is alkaline and that will actually reduce your pH because here's the thing the uric acid won't bother you as long as your the pH of the urine doesn't get too excessively acid so you want it like about six in the urine you don't want it like five um, you don't want it too alkaline, but you just want it slightly more alkaline. So you have vegetables, potassium citrate. Uh, you can get that in the electrolyte powder that I have if you want to do that, or just buy it. But that will actually reduce the, um, kind of like the, um, the crystallization of that uric acid. Um, now, they've studied this and they found that um, it really has, people that have high levels of uric acid, it has to do with the kidney is just not getting, it's not filtering this out efficiently. It's holding on to the uric acid. So there could be some kidney um, damage going on um, that is going to take some time if you're doing healthy keto and IF. There is a, a really good kidney nutritional product by Standard Process. You can look it up. Um, it's called Renatrophin PMG. Renatrophin PMG. Uh, go ahead and order like one of those, I mean one bottle, and just take one before bed and over a period of time I think you might feel better from that. Okay, Vicki from Florida. She's been waiting patiently. Are you there, Vicki? Hey, Dr. Berg. Hi. I just have a quick question. My um, primary care doctor, he freaks out when I take 10 to 20,000 uh, I use a vitamin D a day. And because I'm a nurse, I can quite uh, easily debate with him mm -hmm. thinking I'm a know-it-all. Right. <laughs> and, um, he didn't, you know, ask to check my calcium, you know, he didn't, I feel like I know more than him concerning the subject because I listened to you and a, a couple other doctors. One other doctor mentions he keeps his uh, vitamin D level at 120, mm -hmm. which I don't know what he takes for that, but it's a well-known doctor, you would know him. 
anyways, um, what do you what do you say to that? What what do we tell our doctors when we're trying to get that vitamin D in, and maybe they haven't studied up like you have? Um, yeah, they probably haven't. There's there's quite a few medical doctors who have books on the topic. You can always use them as a reference, but. Um, the question is, well, how, how high is your vitamin D anyway in your blood? Well, I haven't checked it recently, but they were concerned. The main concern came from my sons, adult sons, 21 and 24. They came in, like one came in with a headache, and he goes, well, you, you're, that could be your vitamin D level being too high. And I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so my, I haven't checked mine in a while. Okay. But just the fact that you're taking it, right? He's probably like, oh, you're taking yeah. too much, right? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's fascinating because... 20 minutes, <coughs> excuse me, tw 20 minutes in, in the sun will give you about 15,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, of course, your body will regulate <coughs> excessive amounts if you actually get it from the sun, so you, can, you can't overdo it. Um, there's the really only dangerous side effect or so-called dangerous side effect from vitamin D would be hypercalcemia, uh, high calcium in the blood, um, and then the only side effect, the, the bad one from that would be kidney stones, kidney stones. So in order for you to um, get hypercalcemia by taking vitamin D, you would have to take like 100 to 200,000 IUs, 100,000 to 200,000 IUs over a period of a, a good amount of time. Um, there are so many benefits therapeutically to take um, like 20 to 30, even 40,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, if you're concerned about the kidney stones, um, what you can do is just kind of avoid taking calcium as a supplement and cheese. And then you won't have the calcium to build it into a stone. Uh, the, the benefits of vitamin D are this. First of all, it's almost impossible to get it from your diet because the foods aren't high enough. Um, Many people don't go out in the sun, so they're not going to get it that way. As you age, you don't absorb it. A lot of people have a fatty liver, so and they don't have enough bile, so they're not absorbing it through that way. Viruses and infections, especially you being a nurse, uh, you're probably exposed to different viruses, and the viruses have strategic ways of, of downgrading your vitamin D receptor, and now you're like, you're even low. So vitamin D acts like uh, cortisol in the body. It's a good anti-inflammatory. Um, anytime I get low back pain, I'm like, oh, I need some vitamin D and it completely goes away. So I'm gonna be doing more videos on vitamin D. I have a lot, but it's a fascinating vitamin. I believe it's one of the most, in, actually the, it is the most important fat soluble vitamin. And so because the benefits for the immune system are huge on what it can do to keep your viruses in check, especially related to the flu. Okay, doc, I've got a quiz for you. What's yeah. exciting, but not made of food? The summit. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Steve. You're really, really uh, being creative today. Um, yeah, the summit's coming up. We're actually going to be releasing the uh, video on it uh, any day now. I hope you guys can make it. I really want to meet you in person, but uh, it's going to be in August, uh, at the end of August, so stay tuned for that. I am going to be at the Low Carb Denver Summit coming up in... I guess it's going to be next week already. So uh, next weekend. So I hope I can meet you there too. Yeah, people online are excited about that. I've seen several mentions of that on Facebook. Yeah, well, you know, it's, a, it's going to be quite a long, it's going to be like three days. And um, I, I'm one of the last speakers. So I'll be hanging out. I'll be talking to you because um, what else am I going to do? I'm going to listen to the speakers, but I, I'll have a lot of time to meet you and, and chat. All right, so let's see here. Let's see what good questions. What do you think about stem cells? I think they're, they're wonderful. Um, you can actually have stem cell therapy. It's quite amazing uh, to help um, all sorts of things from regrowing <laughs> cartilage to inflammatory conditions. And there, there's the research is getting more and more on that. Um, you can stimulate your own stem cells by doing fasting if you do it long enough, especially of your immune system and your colon. So if you're doing like a 48 or 72 hour fast, you're gonna be kicking in these stem cells and it's very, very anti-aging. Okay, good. 
Let's how about see. a fundamental question? Here's a, a newbie who, who wants to know, how do I know that I'm entering ketosis? I'm a beginner. The, the best way to know you're in ketosis, you can get the urine strips if you want, um, or you could just basically ask yourself this. Can I go from meal to meal without being hungry? Or do I have to go every three hours and I need a snack? Are your cravings go away, are going away? Is your hunger reducing? Then we know your ketones are activated. That's the best way. And then the other way, Steve, is just to look down. And if you still see your stomach, there's still a ways to go. If your stomach is shrinking, you're in ketosis. Uh, someone asked a question about acidosis or ketoacidosis. Um, do I have to be concerned about that? Um, only if you're type 1 diabetic uh, and you don't regulate your insulin. <laughs> if you're regulating your insulin and being a type 1, you don't have to be wor worried about it. Um, it happens when the blood sugar is out of control. But when you're doing healthy ketosis, um, you don't, you're not going to develop that. And it's just what that is, it's a condition where you're getting s so much as, uh, acidity developing because you're so deep into ketosis because there's no regulation from insulin, it's just like out of control, that it could be dangerous to the blood because your pH is too acid. Uh, but that's, that only happens if you're type 1 and, and if you're ignoring taking insulin and your blood sugars are like 3, 4, 5, 600, okay? That's not going to happen when you do regular ketosis. And plus, if you're eating what I'm recommending, like uh, at least seven cups of vegetables, you're going you're gonna to alkalize the body very nicely, too, to, to keep it in check. Okay, Doc, and here's another rather obvious question, maybe, but I think it's important to remembering that many people are just learning about you in this great new way of life. Yeah. And one of them is Donna, and she wants to know, where do I start? What videos or basic steps to the keto diet uh, you know, and there's just too much uh, information out here, so she wants your counsel. I think the best way to do it, I have a book, but I would probably just get the small book. You can get on Kindle. It's called Healthy Keto and Intermittent Fasting. Look at, look at look how thin this thing is. Okay, you can read this in an hour, and it has all these pictures. It's easy reading. This actually is a really, really, really good summary, uh, and then a lot of times people get this to fill in the, the details. Um, but if you go to my website, drberg.com, click blog, look at the top, it'll say start here. Video one, video two, video three, and you know, you're on your way. You'll get all the basics and um, I'm really working on a couple things right now of getting a better search mechanism on the site so you could find what you need a little bit faster. And also we are working, I'm hiring a team of people to answer all of your questions online because like there's a lot of questions about videos that we already have. So I'm going to have someone basically kind of give you the links so you can actually quickly see that. I'm working on that. So because uh, I don't like not answering all your questions because you guys have a ton of questions and we want to make sure we answer every question. It's just hard for me to do all of these right here. Yes, and you know, they spray by and it makes us sad. I mean, all the folks out there uh, can see that and, I, you know, by the time we get to one, another one's passed up. So that's a great idea, Dr. Burke, because they're terrific questions and we, uh, you know, we always feel bad at the end of every show because there's many that went unanswered and it would be great for them to be able to find yeah, their way. Yeah, because we have 3,000 a day. So I'm going to have to figure out that out, figure that out. Someone asked, will MCT oil break a fast? Um, Yes, it's, it's, it has calories in it. So yes, it's going to break a fast. Will it break ketosis? No. It's not going to bump you out of ketosis because the, you, your ketones are being generated from the MCT oil. But here's the thing. Will it, will it block your fat burning? It'll, it's going to slow down your weight loss because you're, you're going to use the ketones from the MCT and not your own fat. But I recommend MCT oil for a lot of people especially as in the transition phase, especially if they're exercising, especially if they're uh, starting out, it's awesome because it will give you ketones instantly and you'll have your brain will feel better. And it's, even if you, if you have, um, I don't know, Alzheimer's or any type of cognitive issues or um, dementia and you take MCT oil, you're actually giving the brain ketones and it loves that. Ketones will feed a damaged brain better than glucose, way better than glucose. Okay, 
foods that are easily digestible. Soft foods? <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you can actually just take a, you know, like pudding and uh, oatmeal and um, soft foods, like cereal, right? That, that'll be good. Applesauce, and I'm being very sarcastic, Steve. Now, you don't want to do those foods. Those are, they, they're easy to digest, but very bad on your endocrine system. They're going to spike the blood sugar. The foods that are easy to digest are the foods that support your, um, the parts of your digestive system, um, like the fiber, for example. Um, give, feed the microbes. Now you have more microbes to help you digest. Uh, you need fermented foods, like, um, like I like, uh, I eat these pickled vegetables um, and also pickles all the time. Um, moderate protein, low carbs. Those things will actually support your digestion and um, you might need some um, support with from apple cider vinegar to really give you um, probably the most help with your stomach. Anyway, on that note, I really appreciate your attention, your questions. I wish I could have answered every single one, but go to my website. I have a lot of answers to these questions right here. Stay tuned and we'll see you next week. Have a good one.